Tonight, for our, our final address, we are going to hear from Richard Flanagan. Richard was born in Tasmania in 1961, the fifth of six children. He left school at 16, later winning a Rhodes Scholarship to Oxford, where he took a Master of Letters degree. The Rhodes Scholar Register records him as moving on to the position of roof painter. He subsequently also worked as a labourer and river guide. He wrote two history books before turning to writing fiction. His novels have been some of the most acclaimed and beloved works of fiction in recent years. His first novel, Death of a River Guide, in 1997 was described by the Times Literary Supplement as one of the most auspicious taboos in Australian writing. His next book, The Sound of One Hand Clapping, was a major bestseller, selling more than 150,000 copies in Australia alone. His first two novels, Declared Kirkus Reviews, rank with the finest fiction out of Australia since the heyday of Patrick White. Gould's Book of Fish, published in 2001, was his third novel. It's printed in six different colours and was hailed around the world as a masterpiece. Not because it was printed in six different colours, I hasten to add, and it did go on to win the 2002 Commonwealth Writers' Prize. His fourth novel was The Unknown Terrorist, published in 2006, which the New York Times called Stunning, a brilliant meditation upon the post-9-11 world. Richard wrote and directed the film of The Sound of One Hand Clapping, which was released in 1998. It premiered at the 1998 Berlin Film Festival, where it was nominated for Golden Bear for Best Film. He recently collaborated with Baz Luhrmann on the screenplay of Luhrmann's new film, Australia. Flanagan was described by Michiko Kakutani in the New York Times as a master of slate of hand, adept at using words to conjure worlds, an indefatigable artist, while Britain's Daily Mail called him a funny, filming, filmic and gripping writer, a novelist and philosopher for our time. Wanting seems, his new novel seems destined only to enhance his global reputation and has already been shortlisted for the 2009 Miles Franklin Literary Award. So please welcome Richard to the stage to deliver the closing address of this year's Sydney Writers' Festival. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sandra, and uh, thank you all for coming out in this uh, erratic weather. Uh, standing here, I'm reminded uh, of my cousin, Arthur Mad Dog Kemp, a professional boxer of falling note in the late 1960s who uh, featured occasionally on the Golden Gloves TV show and who was once described by the old Melbourne Sun as having, having taken the, uh, the noble art to a new all-time low. He, uh, he was, I must say, in truth, the bottle was really already winning with Arthur and he took to spending much of his life in the park in Fitzroy with the multi-huge humanity that drank and slept there, including those Aborigines who became his best friends. Some years passed and in 1972, Muhammad Ali flew into Australia and the very first thing he said to the crowd at press conference at Tullamarine was, where are the black people? There was stunned silence, but within a short time, Ali's limo was speeding its way to Fitzroy, followed by a motorcade of media. It stopped at a park, and Ali made his, cross, his way across to where Mad Dog Kemp was drinking with a group of blackfellas. Mad Dog still retained something of the old pugilist spirit, and recognising the figure advancing toward them, leapt to his feet, walked up to Ali in front of the world's media and said, you're not the greatest, I am. No, said Ali, you're just the ugliest. <laughs> now, I, I had intended talking to you today about love stories, but at the end of this most marvellous week for Australian writing that began with Christos Chalkas winning the Commonwealth Writers' Prize and has continued with this wonderful festival, it would be wrong of me to not talk about the attack that is presently being mounted on Australian writing. Mad Dog Kemp was part of a sport in which boxers were expected to take falls and lose fights. 
in order to, to benefit rich promoters. And at the moment, Australian writers and readers are being asked to do something similar, to take a fall in order that a few rich people get richer. And I don't think we should be taking that fall. And tonight I want to talk about what strikes me as rotten and stinking about the deal that is being proposed for us all. And so I'd like to begin, as stories should, at the beginning with the word, if not quite at the start, then in the late 4th century AD, when St Jerome translated the Hebrew of the Old Testament and the Greek of the New Testament into Latin. And for the next thousand years, St Jerome's version, which became known as the Vulgate Bible, was the book. But as Latin became not so much a lingua franca as a language of exclusion and privilege, a form of power, in other words, the battle to know the great truth of that age in your own tongue, to hear the stories that mattered most in your own language and idiom, became inextricably bound up with the battle for freedom of thought and for freedom itself. For good reason, the Inquisitor's first question of a suspected heretic was always whether they knew any part of the Bible in their own tongue. And this battle begins in earnest with the birth of the printed word and the desire, punished throughout Europe by hideous death, to read the book, the Bible, not in Latin, the dead tongue of the old imperium, but in the tongue of the field and town, the languages of the people, German, Dutch, French, Spanish, English. In our language, the battle's greatest landmark is the publication in 1525 of William Tyndale's English translation of the Bible. Though there had been English translations before, Tyndale, under the influence of Erasmus of Rotterdam, was the first to base his work not on corrupted Latin glosses, but to return to the Hebrew and Greek originals, coupling his linguistic and literary gifts to a profound humanism. If God spares my life, Tyndale said, I will cause the boy that drives the plough in England to know more of the scriptures than the Pope himself. Tyndale introduced many phrases that the ploughboy might comprehend, such as the salt of the earth, let there be light, filthy lucre, fight the good fight. But in tandem with such earthiness, he brought the poetry of the Hebrew original into the English language, and so we have not the best song, but the song of songs, not the best book, but the book of books. And he made changes that transformed scripture into some of our greatest poetry. By insisting for example, that love and not charity was the correct interpretation of the original Greek in St Paul's letter to the Corinthians 1.13. We have that great poem that begins, if I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. In this way, writes one scholar, Tyndale's Bible directed the language to a form of eloquence that became its paradigm. But this same English Bible was deemed heretical and people caught distributing it were burnt at the stake. Neither did God spare Tyndall his life. Strangled at the stake, Tyndall was also then burnt. But the liberating currents of his Bible were to bring fundamental change, not just to English religion, but to its politics, and more fundamentally and enduringly to the language itself. To make his Bible accessible to the ploughboy, Tyndall had invented many new words, including atonement and beautiful. For such words, many died. Yet the moment this process begins, that time when we discover ourselves in our own vernacular, we gain something extraordinary in the merge, and we begin to invent ourselves anew. For translating the Bible into English simultaneously gave what was a mongrel language a new authority and dignity, while investing it with a grandeur, a poetry, and a sense of transcendence that was not just to inform English literature that followed, but in a fundamental sense invented. The battle to understand this world in our own tongue that Tyndale's Bible represents, to make the universal particular the sacred secular, and the secular in its turn sacred, is a battle 
that has strangely resurfaced here in Australia this year. For it falls to us to once more defend the right, our right and I suspect our deepest need, to our own stories in our own voice, which is also historically and perhaps inevitably that same battle between truth and power. At this moment, as you, many of you would be aware, the Australian Government is giving serious consideration to a proposal that will see the ending of territorial copyright for Australian writers. This dullest and dreariest of phrases, territorial copyright, is the drab motley larded over a measure which will do untold damage to Australian culture. I cannot begin to convey to you the destructive stupidity of what is being proposed, nor the great anger that so many in the Australian book world feel about this proposal. At a recent dinner in New York with the leading publisher in the USA and a leading European publisher, the conversation came round to this matter of territorial copyright being abolished in Australia. But why, asked the European publisher? After all, territorial copyright for writers was fought for from the 19th century and was the basis for the rise over the last 150 years of the novel as the great democratic art form. The American publisher laughed, saying that while Australia's folly would have profit him, why on earth was the Australian government contemplating such an insane idea that would destroy an industry and damage a vibrant literary culture? Why indeed? Even a few Manhattan blocks away from where the king of fraud, Bernie Madoff, flourished with his Ponzi rackets, people know it to be a stupid idea fit only for the most credulous. But in Canberra, our federal government, which sometimes gives the appearance of being almost bizarrely hostile to Australian culture, is now giving serious consideration to destroying one of our greatest cultural success stories. For publishing in Australia, though it has a history almost as old as European settlement, is effectively an industry less than 40 years old, when in 1945 the federal government held a commission of inquiry into Australian publishing, it was told by Harold White, the then Commonwealth librarian, that Australia had no publishing industry. Australian readers were, said Gough Whitlam 20 years later, a captive British market a subject people. Then something remarkable happened. Against the odds, an Australian publishing industry came into being. The battle to build a worthwhile culture of writing and reading in a country so large with a market so small was extraordinarily difficult. But Australian publishing over the last four decades is an extraordinary cultural achievement. In an era when national cultures suffered greatly from globalisation, Ours grew stronger, in no small part because of our book industry. And we now read Australian stories from cradle to grave, and the best of our writing is judged around the world as globally significant. It is also an outstanding commercial success, a story you might think would warm the heart of the coldest free trader. Today we sell more books per capita than most nations, our print runs of literary novels are often the same in absolute terms as the USA or Britain. We export cookbooks, children's books, fantasy books, thrillers, literature, low and high, and every year more and more of our books are being published in more and more overseas countries. And though the book industry returns in GST alone somewhere in the realm of $75 million, it receives virtually no government support other than just $6.7 million in Australia Council grants, much of which goes to other smaller arts bureaucracies. This is nothing like the $100 million of direct subsidy that the Australian film industry receives, to say nothing of the tens of millions more of taxpayer breaks that Australian film enjoys on top of that. Yet Australian film is a cultural industry which, with very rare exceptions, unlike Australian books, struggles to find either critical success or any audience here or overseas. I'm not at all suggesting that our film industry shouldn't be supported to this extent. But on what logic is one industry supported on essentially cultural grounds while another which makes money 
and creates jobs and tax revenue and costs the taxpayer almost nothing, why is it threatened with destruction? For unlike the car industry, the book industry receives neither tariff protection nor endless handouts. Yet ABS figures suggest it employs 15,000 people directly, one quarter of what the car industry does. Unlike the forest industry, it does not receive hundreds of millions in taxpayer subsidies or the fossil fuel industry, which according to a recent NRMA report, receives $10 billion a year in taxpayer subsidies. Yet this same industry generates greater attention for Australia globally, all positive, than almost anything else we do culturally or economically. The big end of town, Dimmick's booksellers in cahoots with Coles Woolworths, are pushing for a change that will see jobs lost, and this remarkable industry crippled, and Australian cultural life dealt a body blow. Misleadingly called opening the market, it will allow the dumping of books by overseas publishers on our market. And this alliance for wealth for profit has given itself the predictably deceitful title of the Coalition for Cheaper Books. What they propose amounts to a return to the old colonial days, perhaps not so old nor so distant as we had thought, when Australian companies merely sold books from another country and we brought with them notions of life that bore little relevance to our own world. While the Coalition's proposal is opposed by everyone from Matthew Riley to Tim Flannery to Tim Winton, from the Australian Booksellers Association to the Australian Publishers Association to the Children's Book Council of Australia, the only people the Coalition for Cheaper Books can wheel out in its defence to plead its supposedly egalitarian cause are those well-known horny-handed sons of the proletariat, Alan Fells and, yes, Macquarie banker Bob Carr. <laughs> and there they are peddling the fiction of privileged writers and grasping publishers opposing cheaper books for the masses. It's all a bit like Fatty Vorton criticising a rape crisis centre for insensitivity to women. <laughs> Which may explain why Dimmicks felt compelled to so shamefully manipulate its customers, using its email subscriber lists to enlist support for its purported campaign for cheaper books. Would the members of its book lovers group have felt so moved if they'd been asked to support a proposal to make big business bigger and richer? And would Dimmick's franchisees welcome a call by Australian writers to Australian readers to boycott Dimmick's stores because of this attack on Australian writing? That would be rightly condemned as destructive stupidity that will cost jobs. But then what better description could be given to Dimmick's own dissembling campaign? For it is the old lie, self-serving elites versus the masses, that the true self-serving elites used throughout the 1990s to serve themselves ever more from the trough. For while the proposal may make money for a few big corporations, it is not even demonstrable that it will make books cheaper. And I will speak from my own experience. My most recent novel, Wanting, was published in Australia for $35 late last year and generally sells at $30. Earlier this month, it was published in the USA, well, where it will sell for US $24, or on the exchange rate in the day of publication, 75 US cents to the Australian dollar, that's Australian $32. But if you add GST, if we were to do that, $3.20, the cost goes up to $35.20. Of course, it will be objected that there is Amazon, and indeed there is. Wanting is discounted on Amazon to $16.32 US, but there is a shipping charge to Australia of $4.99, taking the cost up to $21.31, or at 75 cents to the Aussie dollar, $28.45. Were GST to be added as it is here, applicable at full and not discounted retail cost, the figure comes to $31.65, or more than the discounted price of my novel here. So perhaps this isn't really about cheaper books at all. 
Behind the rhetoric of cheaper books, the coalition is perhaps about something else, a new sensibility among Australian book chains. Some among their number have come to believe that publishers have the whip hand over book chains and that this is a situation that now needs to be reversed, that this is a war and it is a war that will be won by the book chain retailers. They believe it will give them more power to force larger discounts off publishers and increase their own profit margin, while by destroying the viability of smaller competitors, allowing the major chains to increase their market share. It is a mentality that comes straight out of Australian grocery retailing. There, according to a PricewaterhouseCoopers report in 2007, the Coles Woolworth duopoly, that other part of the Coalition for Cheaper Books, control 80% of the national grocery retail market and are pushing aggressively into petrol and alcohol markets. The Coles Woolworth duopoly has the highest level of market dominance in grocery retail in the developed world. Ria Vorha, spokeswoman for the consumer watchdog Choice, was reported in 2007 as saying shoppers were losing out due to the lack of competition. The duopoly, she said, is not doing consumers any favour when they go to the checkout. And the aggressive push by Coles Woolworths into new retail areas such as liquor and petrol doesn't seem to be helping consumers much there either. Last year, RACV petrol spokesman David Cumming was reported saying he was, quote, extremely worried about the huge market share, unquote, of the two retail giants in the petrol sector. While the NRMA claimed motorists were paying eight to 10 cents more for petrol because of the dominance of Coles and Woolworths service stations here in New South Wales. Nor is the Coles Woolworths duopoly doing any favour for producers. The Victorian Farmers Federation, the Horticulture Australia Council and the Australia Beef Association all expressed concerns about the market power of Coles and Woolworths to the ACCC in 2008. A Horticulture Australia Council survey showed 85 per cent of its growers were unwilling to raise issues with major retailers for, quote, fear of retribution, unquote. As business journalist Michael West wrote in The Age last year, a bundle of evidence has emerged from the ACCC inquiry about the chains monstering their comp competitors with town planning laws and monstering farmers because the farmers are forced to deal with them as they cannot go elsewhere, such as the dominance of Woolies and Coal. West went on to say, the push into liquor by Coles and Woolies has left them so dominant in grog retailing that Lyons and Fosters are held to ransom prices. You want us to stock that wine on New Ale? Sorry, you'll have to pay this very low price for it. There's a lot of wine and ale around. West goes on to say that the government has a case for legislative relief that it should pass antitrust legislation, as has been done in US, Canada and the UK. But he concludes this is unlikely. Competition policy has failed, he writes. It is too late. This then is the ghost of Christmas future that now haunts the Australian book industry. To trust companies like Coles and Woolworths Companies with this sort of record, with the Australian book industry, is like inviting the Taliban to babysit the Obama children. No one should pretend surprise with what ensues. One might have thought that the Rudd government would be keen to rein in the excesses and distortions consequent on such a duopoly to wind back its power. But no, far from it. Courage does not seem to be spending many evenings in the lodge lately. Rather, to placate the cruel gods of commerce, the reform the Rudd government is considering is feeding the monster more victims. <laughs>